First of all, I'd like to thank very much the Center for Japanese Research and especially uh, Tristan for organizing this. It's um, just very fabulous what um, the University of British Columbia has been able to pull together. It's just a fabulous thing. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about gender gendered justice, feminism in war and peace. My talk will focus primarily on the war years and within that period primarily on Japanese feminists' attitudes toward gendered violence during the war. But first, it is important to note that when we discuss the war, that we not overlook the linkages of the pre-war, wartime, and post-war eras, what historians call the trans-war period. And lest we think that the war can be easily excised from a positive historical trajectory, it is important to recognize that the individuals who were leading feminists in the wartime period re-emerged as feminist spokeswomen in the post-war period. This includes the women I mentioned in this paper, political feminists like Ichika Husai, Okumumeo, Hiratsuka Daicho, and Yamaka Kikue, feminist intellectuals like Takamura Itsue, and literary feminists like Yosono Akiko, she died during the war, uh, Hayashi Fumiko, Yoshia Nobuko, and Sata Ineko. Most of these women worked in some form of government position or benefited from speaking on behalf of the government during the war, and some, though not all, came to regret their cooperation. The cooperation they regretted was having worked with an evil government that fought an imperialistic war that eventually brought its horrors to the home front. It was those horrors, especially the victimization of women and children on the home front, that drew many feminists into post-war peace movements. The issue most discussed in the past three decades, that of military comfort women, was not, however, an issue that they addressed during the war or in the first decades after the war. In their quest for gender equality, secure lives for women and their families, and gender justice, why did they neglect gendered justice and gendered violence? Most of these and many other Japanese feminists of the pre-war and World War II eras, including activists, writers, and others, have long had long emphasized as part of their feminism women's inherent maternal goodness and opposition to gendered violence. They held ambivalent and even negative attitudes toward Japanese wartime aggression in Asia in the early 1930s. Many were deeply involved in transnational peace movements. Many of these movements were grounded in religion, especially Christianity, and they were terribly worried about their ability to maintain their transnational ties in the context of Japanese imperialism. Over the next decade, those attitudes generally changed to a, a, a position of acceptance. Several well-known women accompanied Japanese troops in China as observers and morale builders in Japan's official pen squadron. Others traveled to China as journalists after the Sino-Japanese War began in 1937. Others were paid by the Japanese-owned South Manchurian Railway to write approvingly about their travels in Manchuria even before Japan occupied that terror, a territory after 1931. Others, like Japan's most prominent women's, women suffragist Ichika Husai and other political feminist activists, went to the continent on their own, that is, not as employees of a Japanese business or the military to build relationships with Chinese women's organizations. Although feminists like Ichikawa claimed to be traveling independent of the state or of the Japanese military, they always benefited from the imperial privilege of Japanese military protection, whether or not they acknowledge, acknowledge or even recognize that privilege. The issue of gendered violence in Japan's war in Asia has, since the 1980s, centered around the issue of the systematic repression of women, some Japanese, but overwhelmingly non-Japanese women, through military sexual slavery. The story of the women called Ianfu, comfort women, has been treated extensively by historians, politicians, journalists, and many others. The details about them change as more evidence is gathered, but at this time most historians estimate that perhaps 200,000 or more women of numerous nationalities, perhaps 80% of them Koreans, so that's been the perhaps that's changed the most, were recruited to serve as sexual outlets for Japanese soldiers. Most were either deceived or kidnapped. The work was brutal, violent, and humiliating. Those lucky enough to make it home often faced extreme ostracism as prostitutes for the enemy. While East Asian governments ignored the plight of the comfort women for over four decades after the war, the comfort women issue has, for the past three decades, been a source of international tension between Japan and several countries. This government-to-government -government tension followed citizens, especially women's, emerging feminist consciousness. 
It comes as no surprise that the Japanese government resisted for a long time acknowledging official culpability, but they were not alone. Other East Asian governments, especially South Korea and the People's Republic of China, led by men embarrassed by the fact that they were unable to do anything to protect their women during the war, or in the case of the PRC, ideologically disinclined to focus on gender concerns, also initially resisted coming to terms with this form of gendered violence. Eventually, they were pressed by their citizens to consider it, and thus did. In Japan itself, not only the Japanese government that was responsible for the military sexual slavery, but also Japan's pre-war and wartime feminists, political activists, writers, social critics, and cultural feminists, have been criticized by feminists and others since the 1980s for not adequately resisting a state that oppressed women as Yanfu. Of course, these feminist leaders were not themselves the perpetrators of the violence, but their silence during the war was seen as complicity. This is an important point to keep in mind, that is, silence was viewed as equal complicity. Their critics contended that they should have been more aware and resistant to government policy than similarly situated male reformers or intellectuals, and they haven't come into the same criticism that the women have. Is this a case of blaming those without the political power to change a heinous situation, or is the critics' point of view that they should have shown more resistance understandable? I tend to take the latter approach while acknowledging the former. How should one deal with people we now view in contemporary terms as flawed? Much has been written by people like me explaining that many, though not all feminists, sought gender equal access to involvement in the state and society. So it comes as no surprise that bourgeois suffragists and even socialist feminists focused on ways of belonging to the state even during the war. In fact, that's why a small number of women, initially eight, then just two, were purged by the post-war US occupation forces for complicity with the wartime government. Many thousands of other women were not purged for their cooperative actions, as neither the Japanese nor the Americans thought women had any voice worth noticing. But if cooperation was a sin, those two purged feminists, Ichikafu Sai and Takeuchi Shigeo, were among the many who did commit it. Suffragist leader Ichikawa never denied that, though her petitions to be depurged and her phenomenal global support stressed her feminism and liberalism, as the term that they used. Her supporters considered her the symbol of women's freedom. But if the war itself was evil, Ichikawa, unlike many who remained silent about their wartime actions after the war, she admitted that she supported her country despite having become persona non grata with Japan's wartime militarist organizations and bureaucracies, including the 19 million member Dainippon Fujinkai, the Greater Japan Women's Association. Her purge had nothing to do with gendered violence, gendered sexual violence, a category not recognized by the primarily US occupation, but rather with her role as an appointed director of the wartime Greater Japan Speech Patriotic Association. But the purge made attacking her, and by extension, other feminists, for failure to resist the military's gendered violence in the form of comfort women, much easier to do when that system was finally problematized in the 1980s. Excellent historiographies of the history of women, sexuality, gender, feminism, and the comfort women appear in numerous recent works, so I won't list them here. But I wish to emphasize the major paradigm shift in the 1980s and 1990s from the earlier views that women did not bear responsibility for the actions of their government during the war because one, they were not enfranchised and were therefore not among the major policy makers, although this view was somewhat mitigated by the purge of Ichikawa Fusai and Takeuchi Shigeo for having been involved in government commissions, and two, those who spoke out were silenced through arrest or more or less violently had their work censored or banned. So as a class, women were generally exempt from criticism for wartime actions. In fact, some historians argued the war was somewhat beneficial to the status of women, at least insofar as it allowed women on the home front in the absence of men to exercise some agency. Other historians rationalized the support of some socialist women for Japanese aggression in Manchuria because it gave work to poor women and men at home in Japan. Of course, these historians did, not, did note that the war harmed women far more than it helped them through starvation, death of their husbands, fathers, and sons on the battlefield, and their own and their families' injuries and death at the hands of incendiary and atomic bombs at home. But none of these historians explicitly addressed the comfort women or had any kind of, uh, or any kind of sexual enslavement of non-Japanese women by the Japanese military. The term ianfu, in reference to non-Japanese women, seems to have been used in a scholarly work for the first time in a 1967 article. But the subject wasn't widely addressed as a major feminist topic uh, immediately after that. 
Only Yamazaki Tomoko appears to have linked imperialism, war, and sexual exploitation in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and she was mainly talking about Japanese women in the overseas sex trades. Uh, the discussion of comfort women initially came from an unexpected source, Japanese veterans, expressing memories of the war through during the 1960s, noted the suffering of women they called prostitutes. Rather than considering the women disgraceful due to their occupation, these men attempted to rescue the Yanfu's honor by stressing that they were virtuous women who made sacrifices that aided Japan's military efforts. In 1973, journalist Senda Kako uh, published a bestseller entitled Jugun Yanfu, Military Comfort Women. Renowned feminist journalist Matsui Yayori addressed the issue in the Asai Shimbun in 1984. But it took a Korean feminist scholar, Yun Chun Ok, speaking on behalf of the sexually enslaved women of her generation and encouraging some of them to come forward with testimonies to make the issue a major cause in the mid-1980s. But there was always the question of how comfort women were recruited. Was it voluntary or involuntary? Was oral testimony that the women were involuntarily pressed into sexual slavery convincing? In 1992, historian Yoshimi uh, Yoshiaki found documents making it clear that the system was organized and run by the military. His evidence made it clear that women were overwhelmingly forced into sexual slavery. Japanese historians Suzuki Yuko, Kano Mikio, and others called out Japanese women leaders in the arts and political movements for not resisting the war sufficiently, saying that they were not unempowered victims as earlier alleged. Though they were seeking gender justice and equality by striving to be members of a nation that denied them full citizenship rights, these critics asserted, feminists failed to see that they were complicit in gendered injustice. And yet almost no one commented on the comfort women system at the time it was occurring. That doesn't excuse the 1940s feminists, as there is evidence to show that they should have known and commented Commented. To give a good example, comparison in, in US history, Thomas Jefferson, the revered author of the Declaration of Independence that inspired liberation movements throughout the Americas, was a notorious slave owner. To excuse him by saying almost every one of his class was a slave owner misses the point that there was an anti-slavery movement on both sides of the Atlantic at his time. He knew about it, and he was not part of that movement. Similarly, today we state that Japanese feminists should have been more alert to the existence and evil of the Yanfu system, but as almost as if they were blind to it as a cause of gender injustice, as were the two million Japanese continental soldiers who saw it daily. Japanese feminists were not blind to other forms of gendered violence. They knew of and condemned the suffering of women and families on the home front in Japan and the battlefront in China. And some even expressed sadness at the gendered suffering of men on the battlefield. Tessa Morris Suzuki published an eye-opening article two years ago that discussed the memories of Australian, British, and American veterans concerning Japanese comfort women. The account with which she opens her article is of an Australian veteran who tried to tell an interviewer who was collecting reminiscences for the Australian War Memorial in the 1980s about comfort women he had witnessed. The interviewer did not wish to know about them. Morris Suzuki includes several impressive examples of such memories in her article. Why did people see but failed to see. For many soldiers, the war presented much bigger concerns, victory and survival, than whether there were women in battlefield brothels, as they called them. For other soldiers, prostitutes were something to laugh at. Some others were so inured to military sex workers, either among the Japanese or the Allied forces, that they didn't even notice them. Some people did, including some Japanese in the field who were court-martialed. Uh, for excessive violence and rape. I guess it had to be excessive. But almost no one cared, so they didn't see it. This reminds me of an experiment that studies inattentional blindness, in which subjects were asked to view a video and count how many times a small group of people tossed two balls among themselves. During that activity, a person in a gorilla suit walked slowly among the ball tossers, but very few subjects noticed the gorilla. They failed to notice the gorilla because they were intently focused on something else, but a few did. And during wartime, combatants as well as people on the home front are intently focused on something else. But a few do notice things like repression of others, so we can't ignore that any more than we can ignore Jefferson's common, but not universal, racism. What examples do we have of people noticing and commenting on comfort women while they existed in the 1930s and 40s, rather than decades after the war? I haven't found many yet, but 
but there are a few, and I suspect that further probing will find more. In 1937, socialist feminist Yamako Kikwe wrote about military sex slaves in centuries past. Historian Beth Katsoff suggests she may have known about Yanfu. Takamura Itsue, an anarchist and hyper-nationalist feminist who became a pioneering feminist historian in the 1930s, railed against Western men in Manchuria who tricked Japanese women into becoming prostitutes, which she saw as humiliating to Japan. Historian Kano Mikio asserts that surely Takamure must have known of non-Japanese women ensnared by Japanese forces. Both Yamako and Takamure were highly focused on sexuality, so it seems hard for me to consider that neither of them knew about the system. If they did have some knowledge, why did they fail even to comment on it? The guerrilla? Fear of censorship? More likely, they didn't really care, since the Yanfu were not primarily Japanese women. Indeed, in 1937, Shigaki Hiroshi, and I don't know who he is yet, I have to find out, wrote about Yanfu in a prominent women's journal, Fujo Shimbun, in which Takamure also published. He remarked on women being sold and questioned whether it was necessary to have Yanfu right on the battlefield. In the end, he concluded that they helped Japanese soldiers by offering nursing services during the day and sex at night. If Shigaki did not get in trouble for raising questions about Japanese policy, surely Yamakawa and Takamure would not have. So fear of repression and government censorship may not explain their failure to condemn the Japanese military for the comfort women system. Another important feminist, Ichika Fusai, I'm working on her biography, uh, wrote in her autobiography, published in 1974, that she noticed comfort women while in China in 1940. But her summary of her China trip in the May 1940 issue of the English language journal, Japanese Women, made no mention of comfort women. I'll show you a document where that is in the afternoon, um, the later uh, workshop. In the intervening 34 years, consciousness of comfort women as a case of gendered exploitation surely contributed to this change in her thinking. Under the protective imperial umbrella of the military in the Japanese occupied sector of China, Ichikawa met with Chinese women in Nanjing. There she had what she called frank and free discussions with a number of women she identified as able Chinese women leaders, that is, wives of those Chinese uh, uh, leaders actively cooperating with the Japanese authorities, and some women school teachers. In addition, she met with individual Chinese women who had come into Nanjing from Shanghai. Of this latter group, she reported, quote, I feel antagonism against Japan considerably strong in them, but they do share a common desire with us that no war may be repeated in East Asia in the future, unquote. Ichikawa stressed the importance of women for the promotion of peace. She wrote that she was greatly touched by the awful disasters of war visible in Shanghai and other cities, and by the mi miseries of the innocent Chinese mass suffering from the consequences of war, unquote. She compared the suffering of the Chinese to that of the Norwegians and Poles, but since that suffering was at the hands of Japan's German allies, I find it hard to fully comprehend Ichikawa's position. Ichikawa continued, quote, everybody has, a pace to, uh, has to pay a price for a war, particularly women pay dearly as wives and mothers. This goes with women on both sides of the current war, Japanese as well as Chinese, unquote. Her contention here and in other writings that war was particularly terrible for women showed her strong conviction that the violence of war was gendered. Ichikawa, like some other feminists, knew there were sex workers on the, on the front lines, but they did not theorize the meaning of Yanfu as victims of sexual violence at that time. For them, gender justice did not include gendered justice. Gender and war were interwoven in various ways. Although we focus primarily on comfort women, that was not the only form of gendered violence during wartime. The feminized forms, such as, like, as starvation, being caught in the middle of the crossfire of battles and bombings, and diseases that targeted the elderly and children, and the masculinized form, death on the battlefield, were not ignored by feminists. Why did they fail to consider the institution of comfort women? I suggest two additional reasons. Class and the stigmatization of prostitutes, which was how the comfort women would have been viewed at the time, in addition to the fact that the women were largely not Japanese. Ichikawa's primary contacts in China were educated women and wives of influential men. It appears that she focused on violence that harmed rich and poor alike, but did not view sex work performed by those who could not escape it as violence per se. The concept of sexual slavery, which many perhaps 
perhaps most activists and historians use today to describe the Yanfu uh, institution was apparently used only in a very limited context. Its use would have opened feminist eyes to the form of gendered violence that comes immediately to mind in today's discourse and would likely have removed some of the stigmatization attached to it. In fact, the Japanese veterans who first mentioned the Yanfu long before historians and feminists did so in the 1980s took care to destigmatize them. The limited use of the notion of wartime sexual slavery was Yamakawa Kikue's 1937 critique of samurai from the late 12th through 16th centuries. Yamakawa wrote that under medieval patriarchy, men fought while women accompanied them on the front lines as, quote, prostitutes who sexually comforted uh, officers and men at the same time that they did slave-like work like washing and preparing food, unquote. Yamakawa praised these women as strong in contrast to the aristocratic women of their time and only bemoaned the fact that their strength and talent were totally wasted on sex work when they could have been serving their samurai leaders in better ways. Pioneering feminist Hiratsuka Daicho, well known since 1911 for her stress on new women, protection of motherhood and eugenics, weighed in as well. A supporter of the war and the emperor system from the mid-1930s on, Hiratsuka had an implicitly negative view of the women who performed sex work on the war front. Her long-held eugenics advocacy centered around protection of wives from diseases transmitted sexually by their husbands, which we first see in the early 1920s. Two decades later, in 1939, she wrote that the Sino-Japanese War, which had become, be, begun in 1937, led to a great increase in the number of soldiers transmitting sexual diseases to their wives. Hiratsuka Asuka's concern was for, her, was for Japanese mothers and children who represented the nation in her view and not for the Korean Chinese and other women from whom their husbands caught the disease. Hiratsuka's glorification of motherhood as women's primary role in war and peace and her view that motherhood was threatened by the medical and social disorders identified with prostitution was shared by many feminists. This stress on motherhood has been written about by numerous historians. One of the Women's Suffrage League's key issues in the 1930s when they were forced to downplay their focus on suffrage was passage of the Mother and Child Protection Law of 1937, which they viewed as a way of enhancing the status of women. In another example, the leaders and members of the Dainippon Fujinka uh, though not necessarily feminists, stressed women's sacred role as mothers of the nation through the first half of the Pacific War. The theme of the Japanese woman sacrificing herself for her family was articulated in every issue of Nihon Fujin, the widely read magazine of that huge organization. Japanese mothers, the magazine noted, were supposed to be pure and chaste. One historian contends that this, quote, made possible the expense of other women, victims of organized sexual violence, unquote. Other feminists, such as Moriyasko and Kora Tomiko wrote about, quote, motherhood for the sake of the nation, unquote. By 1943, however, the stress on motherhood as women's most important role, as well as its definition, shifted as Japan's fortune in war declined. Ichikawa was, an, was among a number of other feminists, including Okomumeo, Japan's preeminent feminist consumer rights leader and a founder, along with Ichikawa and Hiratsuka, the New Women's Association in 1919, and Yamakawa Kikue, to reframe motherhood in a radically new way. They asserted that a stress on motherhood was harmful to the nation, either because it kept women out of the workforce or because it made loving mothers reluctant to send their sons off to war. Though self-sacrifice to protect one's children was now seen as an act of selfish individualism. Women who were shamed into wearing sexless clothing like Monpe were still expected to be chaste. Sex and sex work were downplayed, at first by rampant emphasis on motherhood and later by a rejection of the expression of sexuality. Small wonder that those who performed sex work on behalf of the needy Japanese soldiers received little attention from feminists. So here we see Ichikawa who did focus on forms of gendered violence other than sexual slavery and Yamakawa and Hiratsuka who attacked prostitution on the front lines though not as a violation of women by Japanese troops, all failing to see the gorilla in the room because of classism and or a negative view of sex work inspired by the ideology of maternalism. For those political feminists, surviving the war as individuals or as part of the Japanese nation drew their entire attention. Their focus on the nation, that is their nationalism, at the expense of sexually violated non-Japanese women is precisely what angered later feminists in Japan.
Ueno Chizuko, one of Japan's preeminent activists and academic feminists, has written eloquently about the impossibility of feminism and nationalism to coexist. She is gentler in her treatment of feminists during the war than critics like Kano Mikio and Suzuki Yuko, as she recognizes the existence of government repression, as well as unempowered feminists yearning for respect and belonging in their country under wartime circumstances. But she does contend that their nationalism was an intractable problem. Political feminists like Ichikawa Hiratsuka and Yamakawa were not the only Japanese women who either passively or actively failed to acknowledge the comfort women system. Here we can add cultural feminists, some of them heroes to proponents of peace or to supporters of socialism or poor people's rights. For example, Yosono Akiko, best known for her poem begging her brother not to fight in the Russo-Japanese War, and attacked as a pacifist by the nationalistic Takamure in the 1930s for that poem, was in fact a very nationalistic person, um, and also an important feminist, by the late 1920s. While traveling in Manchuria as a guest of the Japanese-owned South Manchurian Railway in 1928, Yosono praised Japan's role there and was critical of the Chinese when Japanese soldiers staged a bombing that killed the Manchurian warlord a few miles from where she was visiting. Yosono was not a pacifist. A decade later, Fiction writers were enlisted to write glowing stories of Japanese military actions in China. Hayashi Fumiko, who came from an extraordinarily impoverished background before becoming a best-selling author who focused on the plight of the poor and homeless, traveled under Japanese military protection as a journalist for several Tokyo newspapers. Hayashi was the first woman journalist to enter Nanjing and then later Hankou as those cities fell to Japanese troops in 1937 and 1938. From October 1942 to May 1943, she traveled as a member of, J of the Army's Penn Squadron throughout throughout French Indochina, Singapore, Java, Borneo, and Sumatra. Sata Ineko, a well-respected socialist fiction writer, was sent to the war front between 1941 and 43 to write reports for readers at home and to entertain the soldiers on the front. She wrote about her deep sadness when considering the men, Japanese officers and soldiers she met in China. Popular young adult fiction writer Yoshia Nobuko was recruited by the Navy as part of its pen squadron as well. She wrote articles for women's magazines and for war magazines from her travels throughout Northeast Central and Southeast Asia. Were all of these feminist creative writers, normally so observant about life, co-opted into blindness by wartime patriotism enhanced by being on the front lines? Were they limited by censorship or self-censorship in what they were allowed to write? Or were they relieved that they had opportunities to travel as professionals that many other women did not have? And just in closing, I'd like to um, just use a, a quote from the great French feminist historian uh, Joan Scott um, in one of her books, the title of her book, We Have Only Paradoxes to Offer. Thank you. Good afternoon. I've uh, begun to study children and childhood in Japanese uh, modern and contemporary history uh, a few years back. And since then, I can do nothing without pictures. Uh, so I'll show you some today. Um, I would like to uh, start out by uh, referencing our conversation we had in, in this morning, part of which was about uh, what exactly changed between the Tokugawa era and the Meiji period and modern Japan. Um, and I think it's important to uh, acknowledge the very many continuities across this uh, divide. Uh, but in any case, uh, in the modern period, uh, with uh, the Meiji Restoration and particularly in the decades after, uh, we have a new understanding and the formation of a new understanding of childhood, uh, what I will refer to as modern childhood. Um, Modern childhood uh, was understood increasingly uh, as uh, being about children who are both wild and uncontrollable, in need of control, in need of management, in need of education, and at the same time as vulnerable. Uh, children in my talk and in that period, at least until the 1920s, uh, could the, the term children could include a wide range of ages um, and what kinds of ages it really included when somebody spoke of childhood changed over time with the institutionalization 
of childhood through uh, the introduction of mandatory elementary school education and then other uh, forms of education later on. Uh, through the introduction of mandatory military service, um, the uh, whatever childhood one spoke about, it was definitely uh, conceived to be over by the age of 20 when Japanese males had to undergo a military physical exam. Um, and then, of course, other kinds of events such as child labor laws, child welfare laws that were increasingly introduced at the beginning of the 20th century uh, that defined then the vulnerable child as the child from the age of zero to ranging ages, particularly uh, age 11, uh, age 12, age 13, after which uh, a child might have still been uh, referred to as a child but was considered to be uh, able to be self-sufficient and no longer in need of state or uh, other kinds of support uh, if the family wasn't around. So we have an institutionalization of childhood that is very distinct uh, for the modern period. Um, I should also note here that, of course, what children think themselves and how they view their experiences as children is hugely important and there are a number of historians who work on that in the context of Japan, but I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that childhood as a concept is an adult invention. And so I'll allow myself to um, today to discuss primarily how children were represented in different kinds of contexts and were thought about from adult perspectives and were also thought of as useful to very adult kinds of concerns. Um, the setting I would like to use here in, in the context of children at war uh, and children at peace is first uh, to look at uh, children and war uh, in, the, in the context of uh, key sites. And so these key sites uh, were children enacting war in various contexts, playing war, um, but also children being... Um, uh, made to, uh, ex to engage in war exercises. As you see here, um, I don't know whether you can see the caption, but uh, this is a photograph from 1896 uh, when thousands of children were gathered uh, to engage in, um, in uh, maneuvers. Um, I've, uh, in my most recent book, I've looked at uh, children engaged in acting war, uh, both in terms of independent play as well as directed by instructors at school, as well as uh, directed by military instructors. All of these um, forms existed throughout the modern period, and then particularly, of course, as we uh, wander into the 1930s and early 1940s. Um, but that doesn't mean that the understanding we tend to have now of the role of children during the Asia-Pacific War was one that uh, was always around, that was consistent and, and coherent throughout that period. In fact, in a report of uh, a war game, the children organized themselves of about a few dozen of children um, from around uh, the late 1850s, um, it happened uh, that uh, one of these children, so one of these uh, uh, children's groups uh, was representing the Japanese, the other group was representing the Americans, this is post uh, black ships uh, incident, and so one of these children uh, happened to, by accident of course, happened to kill the leader of the American, the group of children that represented the Americans. Um, it came to a court case, the child died, it came to a court case, uh, the uh, parents of uh, both families were brought to court and the uh, surviving child as well. The court decided that the kid who by accident in this play killed the other child uh, did well. He killed the Americans, he did the right thing for Japan, and in fact uh, got a stipend uh, in order to pursue his further studies. So this was a very distinct um, understanding of what the game, how the game should be interpreted and should be uh, seen. Um, half a century or less than half a century later in the wake 
of uh, the first uh, Russo-Japanese War and then the Sino-Japanese War, we have uh, similar instances when newspapers like the Yomiuri Shimbun, for instance, reported of a children's war game and uh, the death of a child that happened to fall into the river in the course of such a game. Uh, at that time, the Yomiuri Shimbun, uh, at that time uh, a very prominent national newspaper, as it still is today, um, reported that this incident as a great tragedy for the entire nation, that even children would engage in a kind of game that mimicked the war that the Japanese military was engaged in at the time. Okay, so a great uh, tragedy. Uh, 1930, in the 1930s, um, with not only these uh, self-organized kinds of games and military exercises in schools, uh, but also grand child maneuvers where thousands of children uh, were brought together in some choreographed kind of fashion to mimic Imperial Army maneuvers. And uh, these events drew tens of thousands of spectators. Okay, think sport, big sport games in that kind of uh, atmosphere uh, in, in the 1930s. And of course, uh, at the latest, begin, this begins earlier in Japanese history, but with the 1930s in particular, uh, there's a lot of uh, writings and encouragement of children um, and of schools to have children engage in such war games. No more language about tragedy, no more language about, oh, how terrible it is that children uh, start mimicking adult uh, kinds of endeavors. Um, and so it's in the 1930s then, and particularly the early 1940s, when there's a lot of encouragement of children uh, engaging in such games. And I'll just show you a number of the uh, visual representations of different kinds of um, such games. Here's a um, artistic uh, take on that, and then a number of photographs of self-organized children's uh, war games. Now, it's important, and I don't have time to go into great detail in this today, but it's important to note here that, of course, these different kinds of uh, enactments of war games have very different kinds of character. Uh, those of you who can see the details on these photographs will also see that both on the very first image I showed of the uh, Akura photograph, uh, and in this photograph, these boys were geta. And so, of course, um, the kind of uh, game one can engage in, in geta, even if um, used to them, uh, is very limited uh, in sort of the realism of a war game. Here, uh, we have a photograph of a kindergarten in Osaka, uh, where boys, in the context of their physical education, engage in rifle practice. Of course, these are wooden rifles, they're not uh, I mean, they are not uh, real rifles of any sort. And so it's really, um, as we move in the, into the uh, 20th century, that um, educators and military instructors and other state agencies uh, take on this position that war games are, in fact, good training for future uh, soldiers. But it is, and this is a Sugoroku, uh, the uh, Kogun Banzai Sugoroku, for girls. I will talk about that and I have copies of that to pass around uh, for our later afternoon session on uh, games. But I would like to emphasize here that as you have seen in these images and in uh, some others uh, I would like to show here with you, in these war games, um, uh, these war games, in representations of these war games, it doesn't matter much whether they are photographs or uh, come from children's publications, uh, they tend to be very clearly gendered. Not all of them are, um, but they tend to be rather gendered. You tend to see only boys in these uh, visual representations of war games. Um, and I should note here that that's not an accurate representation of what and how children actually played. Um, very often, and we know this from uh, other historians' work who have uh, interviewed people uh, who said, well, we actually, the girls also played soldiers and we also played together. And I think it's important here that um, that is very much true for the smaller children, for children up to roughly the age of 12. 
where there's less uh, gender awareness, uh, awareness among the children themselves, but there's also less of an imposition of proper gender roles uh, from uh, parents, from school teachers, and other kinds of institutions. Um, there are a couple of things that happen uh, around the Russo-Japanese and Sino-Japanese War that are important for a kind of new understanding of the uses of children uh, as we uh, go into the Asia-Pacific War. Uh, very important are new media. Uh, photography, uh, for instance, becomes a hobby. Of course, there's been photography and war photography and photography of soldiers earlier than that. But the earlier photographs tend to show soldiers in mass formation, uh, tend to show battle scenes, tend to sort of de-individualize, dehumanize the war. And it's only at the beginning of the 20th century when um, a small number of people still, but still a, an increasing number of men in particular, start to take photographs uh, uh, inside the family. And so there are more and more photographs that feature children uh, in various kinds of contexts, including dressed up in, um, in remnants of uniform um, and um, in, um, in uh, some kind of war setting. Uh, there are also contests, photography, uh, photography contests of uh, magazines, for instance. Very uh, nice magazines like Home Life or things like that. Nothing specialized uh, with respect to uh, the topic of war. Um, hobby photography also goes hand in hand with uh, the emergence of family photographs. So the war is brought into the family in yet another way. Of course, there are other ways as well that uh, have been in place early on, uh, but family albums become something uh, very significant. Um, and of course, children's publications, uh, children's magazines, uh, children's books. Uh, these are also, by the way, the last that lose uh, color uh, publications uh, because they are perceived to be so important uh, in the in the 1930s in particular in order to uh, familiarize uh, children and their families with the war as something to be embraced um, this is a cover of life magazine from 1938 um, and you can see here and life magazine is actually an excellent source for those of you who might not uh, read uh, Japanese but there are several issues that are on Japan in the late 1930s that signal so clearly and so uh, overtly that there's no sense of a Japanese threat uh, to America at the time. In fact, the language that uh, we find in the caption to this photograph inside the magazines, there's a lot about these, this uh, cute boy who, of course, is uh, you know in the great samurai tradition. Yes, samurai in 1938 um, has this toy gun at this particular parade. So children appear in these new media much more prominently than they have been in other uh, than they have been in other places uh, early, in earlier decades. Um, and many of these children are boys. War play in many of these publications is uh, featured as a boys game. Uh, that happens, uh, that changes uh, dramatically if we look at the specific kind of image that reoccurs across different media uh, very, very frequently, um, and I think to very good effect, namely uh, co uh, configurations of, uh, I'm sorry, there's one more of this kind, co-configurations of children with soldiers, or as you have it here, children featured as uh, some kind of soldiers. And um, here comes um, what my, my half of my title, The Power of Innocence, into play. Um, I use the term emotional capital uh, to signify the kind of use value that children 
uh, start to have uh, earlier already, but particularly massively in the 1930s, uh, the kind of emotional capital that is ascribed to children, by which I mean um, that um, representational uses of children register their affective and ritual efficacy. They are seen as embodiment of a basic human goodness. They are used as embodiment, as basic human goodness, as symbol of world harmony, as sufferers, as seers of truth, as ambassadors of peace, and as embodiment of the future. And so I think here we have a very nice contradiction between the kinds of materials one might look at uh, with uh, in, in connection with children at war, namely as children as future soldiers or as future mothers of soldiers, as future defenders of the homeland, at the home front, but at the same time, we also have the introduction of children as the future, as future, as embodiment of future peace. So children here are ascribed much more um, uh, symbolic value than um, I believe we have um, uh, normally uh, acknowledged. And this is um, particularly in images that are all over the place in children's books and children's magazines as this one here, of course very often in the uh, series on uh, kinder book, uh, the, um, which means children's books, uh, that um, and these are then um, uh, images that very much undermine the bifurcated gendered notion of war that you find in the earlier pictures and in other kinds of stories about children and war. Okay, So here we have in these images when children take on the role of um, uh, being sort of the tender, uh, affective component in an image that do all kinds of work uh, with respect to the soldier in the image, then we mostly have boys and girls. This is not a, a task that is attributed only to girls or only to boys. Um, and so what I uh, argue here with respect to these images is that they exploit the feelings of tenderness associated with images of children. They focus on children's sweetness and tenderness. Um, children appear in soldier's arms, as in the previous picture, uh, to enhance his humanity. And they're always boy and girl, or a couple of boys and a couple of girls. Okay, and so. We have here a lot of um, things going on. Uh, children make the soldier appear as a playmate, as a substitute mother, as savior of children, as a big brother. All of these roles come uh, to the fore in different kinds of images. And so you have a lot of images here um, in, in that uh, period that constantly show little children in conversation with soldiers, smiling with soldiers, receiving candy from Japanese soldiers, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and so I think what is very, very important here is that children are given the role here of uh, transgressing the front lines in a way. Um, because of course these Japanese soldiers are not with Japanese children, they're with Chinese children and Manchurian children, children elsewhere uh, where Japan uh, takes control at the time. Uh, but they signal to children at home, the Japanese children, that these men, their brothers, their uncles, their fathers, are really kind of nice men. They are the kind of nice men they are at home to these other children. And they, these images come with a lot of uh, rhetoric about how important it is for Japanese children to get to know children in the colonies and in the uh, territories uh, under Japanese control in order to be able to build a future peace. Okay, so they are future soldiers, but they are also the carriers and the embodiment of future uh, peace. In these images, I argue, uh, they blend soldiers with children, war with play, and violence with care. Uh, because soldiers here, for these smaller children, are always represented not as warriors, not as fierce warriors. There are also, there are other kinds of materials that do that, but they are always shown as 
caring as giving something to the children, befriending children. Of course, we have a whole literature of um, soldiers' memoirs written during that time for Japanese children to tell them what a fabulous time they had with children uh, in uh, the colonies. Fabulous in the sense that they befriended these children, that these children were so much worse off than Japanese children, uh, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of um, uh, 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 political work that I think is done here. And here you have uh, just one of these images, uh, very, very um, interesting, I think, uh, of in the forefront, you have a soldier giving uh, Meiji caramels uh, to a child uh, at the front, presumably, and in the background, you have a mother giving this, this is an, an ad for Meiji caramels. Um, in the background, you have a mother giving the same caramels to her children at home. And the text indicates, here you go, the soldier gives the same caramels to children, haven't you just received those from your mother? Um, so there's a lot of um, connections that are made between children here and there, uh, between soldiers and children out there, and soldiers and children uh, within uh, the mainland uh, in Japan. Um, there are also um, uh, the, the, the roles are also reversed sometimes, and you have, uh, for instance, children visiting soldiers in the hospital where they become the caretakers, where they become uh, symbolically uh, those who entertain the soldiers. Um, and so, uh, as you can see here, they bring uh, various uh, comforting, supposedly comforting uh, items to the soldiers and, and indicate that there is also a reversal, a particular kind of familiarity, but also a reversal of role, roles uh, possible in these encounters. And here another one. I thought this one was uh, particularly impressive in all the ways uh, that I just outlined uh, because uh, you have, this is a page in a children's book from uh, 1940 where you have Japanese Imperial soldiers uh, just receiving comfort letters from children in Japan that they then read uh, to these uh, brown children somewhere in the South Seas. Um, and then um, there are also uh, letters in such children publications of uh, the thank you letters from the uh, children in these uh, places. Um, now I'll take a couple of more minutes. Um, with the end of the war, since uh, I'm supposed to talk about children at war and peace, um, when we move into the post-war period uh, in Japan, one of the astonishing, to me astonishing, continuities. Of course there's a lot of um, disruption and there is something very, very horrible and huge that ends with the end of the Second World War, with the Asia Pacific War. But there are certain kinds of continuities uh, that uh, on, on, with respect to the uses of children that I think are rather fascinating. Um, some of the most uh, widely circulated images of the occupation era uh, mimic in many ways the kind of wartime photographs and uh, children's uh, publications Namely, now you have allied soldiers with Japanese children uh, in very similar kinds of formations, uh, conveying very similar kinds of uh, messages. And of course, if any of you ever open a newspaper or uh, look at media reports, think about how often do you see American soldiers in friendly chats with Iraqi uh, boys um, when they have just killed uh, their parents and their villages. So this is a very very pervasive kind of uh, uh, figure that uh, has lived on and traveled uh, in many different ways. And here's a cover of uh, one of the first English um, radio programs. Um, <laughs> I would like to, if Tristan allows me, yes, you allow me, I'd like to jump to the present, uh, not to suggest that this is the same thing, but uh, to at least point out 
the parallels between uh, the kinds of videos the Ministry of Defense uh, in current day Japan puts on their website for consumption um, that um, combine, as you will see, an incredibly reactionary, gendered, uh, and uh, conservatively gendered uh, family to do something that I find very interesting, but that is also very new, at least uh, viewed against the re most recent kind of uh, public relations material of the self-defense forces. Namely, uh, there is a video where children explain to other children what the self-defense force is actually for. And in my book, I put this in the larger context of a lot of different strategies the self-defense force public relations apparatus engages in to make itself look really small, really like a child, but also really appealing to childlike sensibilities. So just a couple of minutes. Is, is, that, is that okay? One? Yeah. Is it, okay. is it right here or is it the other Yeah, one? it's right here. Oh. What did you do? Oh, I'm sorry. You just yeah. hit play here? Yeah. Or is it this one right it's, here? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So you have the very unlikely case of a family with three children. So the 
the video goes from there and the little bird that has become alive explains to the children what the father actually does as a self-defense forces officer, which is very, very interesting because the authority of explaining what his job is is taken away and is completely taken into the children's realm, uh, which I think is a very interesting strategy that uh, the self-defense forces have only uh, started to engage in recently. Uh, let me end by saying the youngest age group, uh, historically speaking, is ungendered and as such fulfills important persuasive roles via its emotional capital. So I think there's a particular uh, a political um, power embedded in uh, degendering children of a particular age, uh, under 12 year olds to uh, pin it down, I imagined uh, to be innocent, uh, innocent um, in terms of uh, politics, but also most capable of being, of learning about the military and war. And that, I think, is one of the continuities that you see here. It, this is precisely in a setting of small children because the self-defense forces, the Japanese state believes, possibly correctly, that it's the youngest children that would be most open uh, to its uh, messages. So I want to st uh, stop here. Thank you so much. The first half of the 1940s in Japan is often described as a state of total war. And not surprisingly, propaganda materials were crucial to military goals as the government worked to sell this war to the people, as David Earhart puts it. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is to explore the ways in which the war, the war was sold to Japanese women and what kinds of female behaviors, appearances, and attitudes were promoted as most desirable for the project of total war. And the specific medium of um, propaganda that I will explore is kamishibai. Most simply, kamishibai is a set of pictures used by a performer to tell a story to an audience. In its original form, kamishibai was a street performance aimed at children. At the sound of the performer's wooden clackers, children would gather from all directions. The performer would first sell them candy, and then, while the children ate the sweets, would relate a set of three short narratives, each illustrated with a series of hand-painted pictures. These were set in a small wooden stage affixed to the back of a, the kamishibai man's bicycle and pulled out one by one to reveal the next scene. Now, this is the entertainment version of the medium, and it was aimed exclusively at children. But during Japan's 15-year war from 1931 to 1945, Kamishibai was a crucial medium for the dissemination of propaganda to a variety of audiences, adults, in fact, more often than children. At least 15, I'm sorry, at least 70% of wartime plays were aimed at an adult or a mixed age audience. The Japanese government began using Kamishibai in its propaganda efforts from as early as 1932, but it was not until the late 1930s, in the days of the mobilization campaigns of the um, 1937 and 1938, and then the Shin Taisei of 1940, that government and quasi-governmental groups began actually commissioning and sponsoring plays on specific themes. So this is a picture of a performance of a propaganda kamishibai play. Unlike the original version of the medium, propaganda kamishibai plays included no candy, performers were instructed to read exactly the dialogue or explanation that was printed on each story panel, no deviations, jokes, or elaborations were allowed. Performers were not to smile or laugh as they worked, and were cautioned not to try to make the audience laugh either. Propaganda kamishibai performers were told to efface themselves and to emphasize the story. Um, this obviously is a play aimed at a mixed-aged audience. You can see all the adults standing in three rows in the back, and then rows of children in the front. Propaganda plays were performed at a range, at a range of venues, schools, factories, production union meetings, mines, tonarigumi, that is neighborhood association meetings, meetings of agricultural unions, parents group meetings, military bases, behind the lines on the battlefield, and in Japan's colonial possessions and occupied territories even. Kamishibai's low-tech nature and its association in the public mind with children's culture made it particularly useful for communicating messages to disempowered, lower class, or less educated people including children, women, farmers, the urban poor, and the inhabitants of Japan's colonies, 
people who might be suspicious of more elitist, more obviously propagandistic media. Nonetheless, the Kamishibai texts I'm addressing here are explicitly propagandistic. That is, they are meant to persuade the viewers into or out of particular beliefs. And even more particularly, I'm talking about mobilization propaganda in a time of war. In Frames of War, Judith Butler claims that, quote, once we acknowledge that the frames through which the material needs of, needs of war are affirmed or denied make possible the practices of war, we have to conclude that the frames of war are part of what makes the, the materiality of war. <clears throat> Just as the matter of bodies cannot appear without a shaping and animating form, neither can the matter of war appear without a conditioning and facilitating form or frame. The perceptual realities produced through such frames do not precisely lead to war policy, and neither do such policies unilaterally create frames of perception. Perception and policy are but two modalities of the same process." End quote. So one way of glimpsing the frames that configured Japan's war is to look at the stories and images created by or sponsored by the government to persuade people to buy into the imperial and military project, such as wartime kamishibai. Now, one salient property of propaganda, as opposed to other communicative modes, is its instrumentality. Propaganda is trying to encourage or discourage a particular behavior or belief. There were a number of kamishibai plays that had the explicit goal of encouraging people to buy war bonds, for example, and others that discouraged people from specific kinds of extravagance. So another salient aspect of propaganda is that it often attempts to persuade people to pursue a specific behavior or belief that may be against their own interests or preferences or against their better judgment. I won't go further into the definitions of propaganda this afternoon, except to say that it is never ethically neutral. Political philosopher Stanley Cunningham writes, quote, because it inverts epistemic values such as truth and truthfulness, reasoning and knowledge, and because of its wholesale negative impact upon voluntariness and human agency, and because it also exploits and reinforces a society's moral weaknesses, propaganda is an inherently unethical social phenomenon. <clears throat> This is true even when a government is using propaganda to mobilize its own citizens, I would argue. But how do we distinguish propaganda from more innocuous or even beneficent forms of, co of communication, such as persuasion? Garth Jowett and Victoria O'Donnell emphasize that persuasion is interactive with both parties benefiting. And further, persuasion is based on accurate information. Propaganda, in contrast, is based on deceit. Again, even when we're talking about domestic mobilization propaganda, a government deceiving its own people, and benefits only one party. Now, deceit has a somewhat mild sound, but Cicely Bach argues that it cannot be taken lightly. Quote, oh, sorry, violence and deceit, quote, are the two forms of deliberate assault on human beings. Both can coerce people into acting against their will. Most harm that can, be, that can befall victims through violence can come to them also through deceit. But deceit controls more subtly, for it works on beliefs as well as action." End quote. <clears throat> so my concern is to identify the kinds of deceit practiced on the Japanese people through the medium of, of Kamishibai during the 15-year war. <clears throat> the producers of propaganda Kamishibai were careful to make sure that each play was aimed at a specific demographic group with the intention of promoting or discouraging a specific behavior, sometimes through direct exhortations, but much more often by providing attractive characters that the viewer would be inspired to emulate. Recognizing the extremely important roles that must be played by women if the war effort were to succeed, as of about 1939, propaganda kamishibai producers began actively recruiting female playwrights, believing that their skills in creating vivid and memorable female characters would appeal to women on the home front. The job of these female playwrights was to frame the war in such a way that the audience members, female and male, would understand clearly which material practices and what kinds of feminine behaviors were sanctioned as proper and necessary for the war effort. The three most prolific producers of propaganda kamishibai scripts were Yoshida Haru, Suzuki Noriko, and Inaniwa Keiko. I only have dates for one of them because, um, like most kamishibai artists and scriptwriters, there's very little known about these people, about their lives. Um, what they did before or after the war. 
Today, for reasons of time, I'm going to concentrate on Yoshida Haru. But I'll just briefly mention two of the most famous plays from wartime, one of which was written by Suzuki Noriko and the other by Inani Wakeko. And I should point out, by the way, that these plays were shown very widely and by no means just to female audiences. These two very well-known plays are Gunshin no Haha and, sorry, and Mume no Haha, both of which feature as protagonists families of marginally literate farmers. The plays concern the superhuman work undertaken by the mothers of the family to ensure that their sons have every opportunity to get an education so that they can then go off and support the war effort. The mothers are shown as plain but extremely sympathetic characters who bask in the adoration of their sons. Until the day they are informed of the young men's apotheosis as gunshin, that is gods of war, which is to say the day that they are informed of their deaths. The mothers may grieve briefly, but they do not repine, nor do they express any regret for their earlier support for the son's military career. The stalwart women in these plays go back to their hard work with no hint that they feel themselves to have been deceived by the glorious martial rhetoric that enticed their sons to their death. <clears throat> The combination of self-sacrificing mother and self-sacrificing soldier son is a very common theme in kamishibai plays aimed primarily at rural women, but there were other significant patterns aimed at different demographic groups. You may have noticed that the women in the two plays I just introduced wear mompe pretty much throughout, as befits middle-aged farming women. But how to convince younger women to stick to boring, unflattering mompe when those young women may have had aspirations to be the pretty, sweet, desirable but pure Nadeshko, for whom the soldiers were meant to be fighting. Yoshida Haru's Tamao Sentie from 1941 is addressed to young farming women, and its purpose is to convince them not to desire stylish Western clothing, but rather to be content with their practical Monpe work clothes. The protagonist, Toshiko, the young woman on the right, is asked by her brother-in-law to come to Tokyo to help take care of her older sister, who's about to give birth to her fifth child. Toshiko agrees on the condition that the brother-in-law buy her a chic Western outfit in Tokyo. He's desperate to persuade her, so he agrees. After she arrives in Tokyo, <clears throat> Toshiko is a great help to her sister. But one day, she asks her sister about the promised Western clothes. The older sister is surprised, and later she berates her husband for having promised something so extravagant. Toshiko overhears their conversation and cries, but does not give up her wish for a Western dress. Her older brother-in-law buys her the outfit, but continues to try to make her understand that this kind of spending is wasteful. Later on, sitting with her sister in her stylish new clothes, uh, the sister's just given birth here, Toshiko sees a newspaper advertisement for dangan kitte, that is ammunition lottery tickets, and explains to her sister, quote, it's two yen to buy one, and if you win, the top prize is a thousand yen. There are lots of other prizes, too." End quote. They promise to buy one for her, and her brother-in-law tells her that this is something worth spending money on, since the proceeds go to, to supplying ammunition to the soldiers. The scene shifts to Toshiko's home, where her mother and friend are talking about the stylish outfit she will wear when she comes home tomorrow. But to everyone's surprise, Toshiko returns in the same old kimono as when she left. Moreover, the next day, back in Monpe, she tells her friend that in Tokyo, many people wear mompe, but the Tokyo ones are not as nice looking as the ones in, to in uh, Toshiko's hometown. Soon, Toshiko sees in the newspaper that her lottery ticket has won. But because she is now reformed, instead of using her winnings to buy some more clothes, she goes back to the post office to buy more ammunition lottery tickets. And then the play ends with this um, advertisement for the ammunition lottery. <clears throat> So this play is a focused attempt to encourage young women not only to save money and goods by eschewing Western clothing, but also to understand, at least implicitly, the meaning of their clothing choices within the discourse, within the discourse of total mobilization. Wearing the right clothing not only signals compliance with nationalist goals, but also enacts that compliance in an embodied way. The play's primary meaning is encapsulated in its final panel that we see here, which urges viewers to buy ammunition lottery tickets tickets. But as in the case of most kamishibai plays, there are multiple levels of ideological instruction happening at once, explicit and implicit, visual and textual. 
Here we can get a hint of the potential effectiveness of a kamishibai as a medium of propaganda. This play sends the same message as common wartime slogans, such as zeitaku wa tekida, extravagance is the enemy, or hoshigarimasen, katsumade wa. I won't be greedy for new things until we win. But the play conveys its message through charming characters, as well as, as well as implying to its young female audience members that such moral behavior could potentially result in a very, a very material reward, winning a thousand yen. There's no time today to discuss at length the comparison between Japanese home front pop propaganda regarding clothing and that of Britain during the war, but I would like to quickly point out that in those two nations, the rhetoric was very different. The Japanese government recognized the importance of women's contributions to the war effort and created plays like Tamao Senchie to urge young women to give up their desire to be elegant and fashionable and to find monpe and other practical clothing desirable. In contrast, although the British government also recognized that the contributions of women were crucial to the war effort, it chose a different strategy. The government made supporting women's morale a priority. In consequence, in 1941, even after the clothing ration began, the slogan, beauty is duty, was promoted, very much in contrast to zeitaku wa tekida. Attempts were made to ensure that women's clothing remained stylish and attractive even under the ration system. As visual culture historian Antonia Lant puts it, the survival of femininity is a patriotic sign of strength and perseverance, and therefore the confidence and mood of the entire nation, male and female, is boosted by the maintaining of feminine beauty in a time of war. This was the British attitude, but as we see from Yoshida Haru's Tamao Senchie, the Japanese government had a very different sense of what was most appropriate for women in wartime. Let's look at another play, again by Yoshida Haru. This one is called Haha wa Manzaishi. Mother was a Manzai performer from 1941. And this play is remarkable in several ways. It features an extremely charming and likable female protagonist who goes to the battlefield and comes under enemy fire. And the point of view, as we can see from the title, is that of a child vis-a-vis -vis her parent. So Haha wa Manzaishi tells the story of Manzo and Senko who leave their popular Asakusa Manzai act to join a diverse group of performers traveling to China to cheer the troops. They leave their 13-year-old daughter, sitting there on the right, um, <clears throat> home with her grandmother on the left, and as Senko says goodbye to Nobuko, and then immediately begins on the train to write her a letter, she's chastised by Manzo, who says that on this trip, Senko must think and act like a professional, not like a mother. In fact, because he is the troop leader of their tiny little two-person troop, she must call him Dan san troop leader, rather than the usual anata. And Senko promises to try. Once in China, they are greeted with glee by the soldiers, who are delighted to see a Japanese woman after so many months abroad, and who thoroughly enjoy the Manzai act. Senko and Manzo are then asked if they would be willing to venture even further into enemy territory to entertain a troop pinned down in a dangerous area. They agree, but on the way there, they come under enemy fire. And at this point, we see the remarkable scene of Senko carrying a wounded soldier on her back to safety. As you will expect, however, if you know much about wartime kamishibai, Senko is herself shot soon thereafter, and we see her dying in her husband's arms. As he begs her to shikarishiro, to hang on, she opens her eyes and says faintly, dan san and then dies. The next thing we see, and I think this is brilliantly depicted, is the ominous scene of Nobuko coming home from school to find strange boots in the Genkan. She manages to hold herself together, although her grandmother is prostrate with grief, while the guest tells her of her mother's brave death, just as brave and noble as that of a soldier. But then Nobuko runs outside, and the script tells us that, pressing her face against the fence, she could no longer control her grief, and her tears poured out as she cried out again and again, Okaa-chan, or mother. And this is where the play ends. As mentioned, Yoshida Haru's description, a depiction of the wife in this play is very appealing. Senko is witty, strong-minded, loving, brave even under fire, and thoroughly professional. The message to women viewers seems to be that if they can subdue sentimentality 
and serve the nation professionally and bravely, then even if they don't die from a bullet the way Senko did, their contributions to the war effort can be considered as important as those of soldiers. But this message is undercut by the fact that the point of view of the play is in many ways that of Nobuko, and we end with her heart-rending grief. It's very hard to see any positive result for her in this narrative. In other words, there's remarkably little, little deception here. Children in Japan were lo losing their parents, fathers and mothers, to the war, and the result was devastating, as this play makes clear. So how on earth could it have passed the censors as constituting proper propaganda? What does this tell us about how the war was framed for women? Well, this play, as I said, is remarkable for putting a woman into several situations that are reserved exclusively for men in other kamishibai plays. Among the most well-known narrative and visual tropes in, kamishibai, in propaganda kamishibai, for example, is one soldier carrying another on his back, as we see in these examples from two different plays. And here, we see Senko performing that same deed in her skirt and sensible but decidedly feminine shoes. Another example is a scene where Manzo cradles the dying Senko in his arms, which is again a familiar trope, as we see here, and here, and here. You'll notice that in all the cases I just showed, it is a soldier being cradled by another soldier. Disturbing and sorrowful as these images are, in propaganda kamishibai, the death of the soldier is taken for granted, taken as a given, at least potentially. And with enough repetition, the viewer becomes at least somewhat inured to these sorts of deaths. But to see this tweaked so that it is not a male body in uniform, but a female body in civilian clothing dying on the battlefield is a powerful repurposing of this familiar trope. Moreover, in the case of the soldiers, we rarely have any last words. Or when we do, as in this particular play, Mume no Haha, the dying man invokes his mother. And those words are broken and pitiful. Senko's last word, however, Dan Cho san, shows both presence of mind and wit, affectionately teasing her husband as she dies in his arms. The power of such an appealing portrayal of female strength may have struck the censors, and for all I know to the contrary, the viewing audience, as a powerful inducement to women to emulate Senko's devotion to the cause. There's no time today to go into detail about how this kind of framing of the war may have functioned to persuade Japanese women to continue their efforts in supporting the war. So let me just sum up like this, kind of a real generalized sense of how Kamishibai kind of worked, even despite the sadness of these plays. <clears throat> Kamishibai plays were among the only forms of entertainment in the final years of the war, and made use of multiple sensory paths to pull viewers into the emotional gestalt of the story. There was the script, which ranged from authentic sounding dialogue in local dialects to high flown patriotic rhetoric. The pictures, which while deliberately somewhat primi primitivist in some cases, were often beautiful and evocative. And the performance, which might include heartbreaking songs at the most emotionally charged moments of the play, is another aspect of these kind of multiple sensory um, thing. Ensuring that the entire audience, whatever their private views of the war may have been, sobbed together as one. When we read memoirs of people having gone to Kamishibai performances during the war, it's everyone breaking into tears at the same moment and sobbing through the end of the play that we have noted. The resulting sense the entire Imperium was working, and more importantly, feeling together in unison, was a key goal of propaganda Kamishibai. Thank you. This paper aims to bridge together two different projects that I have worked on, one on martial motherhood in early 20th century Japan, and one on post-war budget keeping and cooking. This workshop has provided me with a great opportunity to connect these projects and examine my current research from a different perspective, namely the ways in which women rebuilt and reconceptualized gender, family, home, and nation after the war ended. I will begin by briefly explaining the first project, what I refer to as martial motherhood, which Sherilyn engaged with in her talk as well. The ide uh, ideology of martial motherhood required women to send their sons off to war without public displays of distress or anxiety. The stoic, tearless, and child-sacrificing gunkoku no haha, uh, which I translate as the martial mother, 
had been the state's ideal wartime mother since as early as 1905. Japanese citizen subjects were first introduced to the martial mother in national ethics textbooks with stories like Mother of a Sailor, in which a mother wrote a letter to her son serving in the Navy. In this letter, she called her son a coward for not fighting in battle and told him that she prayed at Hachiman Shrine every day in hope that he would actually fulfill an admirable purpose while away at war. Wartime films brought the martial mother to life in a new medium. In a scene from Sea War from Hawaii to Malay, uh, a mother states that her son is no longer a member of the family after he leaves for military training, insinuating he was already dead to her. This constructed and widely circulated gender ideal, however, did not represent the actual feelings of most mothers. During the Pacific War, many mothers felt pressured to adopt a martial mother persona in public, but privately they feared the imminent death of their sons that they sent to war. After the war ended, the martial mother was expunged from ethics textbooks as teachers across the country instructed their students to dip their brushes in black ink and blacken over any mention of militarism in the stories they had become accustomed to teaching. Women, men, and children disengaged with Japan's recent militaristic past and dethroned both male and female wartime heroes. In the shadow of such militaristic and nationalistic gender ideologies, this paper asks, how was gender reorganized in the post-war, and who participated in this process? Some scholars have written on this topic, including Sheldon Guerin, who argues that the Japanese state played a strong and not so subtle role in mobilizing women to help the state achieve its goals in the post-war. Andrew Gordon has also written about the post-war new, uh, new Life Movement and how the movement's male leaders addressed and guided housewives, reinforcing traditional gender roles along the way. My research builds on and diverges from this scholarship by arguing that women themselves participated in reshaping gender roles uh, in the post-war. Current historical interpretations tend to rest on the assumption that women did what they were told to do, either by carrying out the government's plans or by faithfully fulfilling gender roles. Um, that were constructed and promoted by the government. Neither interpretation really grants women much agency, so by contrast, this paper places women, specifically housewives, at the center of the narrative, demonstrating that they were politically active on their own terms, and that their activism played a role in constructing a gender division of labor that was both political and domestic in the post-war. To make this argument, I will engage with two, uh, the stories of two women, Nakamura Kimiko, a housewife from Yamanashi Prefecture, and Okumumeo, a famous feminist politician who served in the Diet in the post-war. Additionally, there is an historical document, one that we will be examining in our primary source workshop later today, that sheds light on how women reshaped gender in the post-war, and that is Kakebo. Um, so Kakebo, or personal household account books, are exceptional historical documents and that they are filled out almost exclusively by women and provide valuable insight into the lives of ordinary women, particularly housewives. Kakebo are connected to a vaunted gender role in Japan, which is women as the primary purchaser consumers. Um, U.S. historian Elizabeth Cohen first proposed the term purchaser consumer in her book, A Consumer's Republic. Cohen defines the purchaser consumer as someone who contributes to her society by exercising her purchasing power. In post-war Japan, the government, women's organizations, and women's magazines all propped up women as the primary purchaser consumers of their homes and their kakebo as their weapon of choice in the battle for bu uh, budget management. So for this research project, I have relied heavily on one kakebo and one kakebo keeper, and that is Nakamura Kimiko, and this is a picture of one page or two pages from her kakebo. She wrote in her household account book almost every single day uh, from the time she married her husband, Nakamura Kosaku, in 1954 until the 2000s. Kimiko wrote down um, in her kakebo every single item and service her household purchased. Um, in 1957, the Nakamura family moved to Yokohama in Kanagawa Prefecture, where they settled down and raised their family. In 1968, Himiko attended a household group course run by the Yokohama Seikyo Co-op. The group decided to start what they called a kakebo movement, which I will return to shortly. In 2010, Kimiko donated all of her account books to the National Women's Education Center located in Saitama Prefecture. The National Women's Education Center uh, recognized the significance of her kakebo and displayed them in their museum. They publicized the collection and digitized all of her kakebo, which we are seeing here. 
The amount of information that is contained in account books is extensive, detailed, and personal. So I'm going to show you an example of one week's worth of copyable entries. So this would typically take up two pages of a copyable, kind of like a planner. I've split this example up into two slides because it would not fit on one slide, um, but I'll quickly go over it. The days of the week are at the top, and here the budget is on the left. Um, so how much she uh, plans on spending in each category is allotted on the left. Um, the first page includes all of the food categories. Um, so this cocky boat keeper wrote down all of the food items she purchased and how much they cost under each day. And then she added up how much she spent in total. And then here's the second slide, which shows other expenses such as light, water, heat, clothing, culture, entertainment, taxes, savings, insurance, and uh, total expenses. The history of cocky boat keeping is a trans war story. Cocky boat keeping emerged alongside diary keeping in 19th century Japan. Keeping a record of one's household and its finances was connected to Meiji era nation building and the construction of the family nation. Meiji ideologues identified the state with the family, designating the emperor as the father to his childlike subjects, and each family acted as the foundation of the nation state. The idealized domestic good wife, wise mother role emerged in tandem with the rise in Japanese nationalism and the idea of family nation. As part of the family nation, the loyalty of good wives and wise mothers was tied to their loyalty to their nation and their emperor. Financial record keeping and budgeting became one of the duties of good wives and wise mothers, uh, good wives and wise mothers, and uh, was tied, uh, and they were expected to perform uh, their loyalty and filial piety vis-a-vis -vis family and nation. Meiji ideologues were not the only proponents of this new gendered custom, as women's magazines played an integral role in promoting kakebo keeping. For example, in 1887, Anato no Tomo magazine printed an article titled um, Kanai Bokiho, which was a wife's bookkeeping guide. And the, uh, the article asserted that a wife's main role in her family was to manage the household's finances, and that it was her responsibility to balance expenditures and income. Hani Motoko, the founder of Fujin no Tomo magazine, invented the first kakebo uh, in 1907, a version of the kakebo that is still around to this day. Um, the Hani Motoko kakebo, as it was called, included detailed explanations of how to calculate a budget, and the publication of Hani's kakebo reinforced the gender norm of the budget-keeping housewife. The modern tradition of kakebo keeping continued into wartime and the post-war period. Publishers printed kakebo with nationalistic slogans in the margins during the Pacific War. Understandably, however, women and their families faced constant dangers and anxieties during the war and as a result tended to push careful financial planning and record keeping to the wayside. After the war ended, however, the housewife's companion, Shufu no Tomo magazine, urged readers to take up their kakebo once again, restoring a sense of normalcy and planning to their lives. In making the plea, the housewife's, uh, the housewife's companion played a major role in reviving the kakebo tradition in the post-war, and in 1950, it published its own kakebo. The focus of my second project picks up from this point, early in the post-war, where kakebo keeping connected women to a modern, relatively new gender norm, while also setting the stage for women to become important political and economic actors in the post-war. The project examines kakebo through the lenses of politics, food, and labor, but beyond this, more importantly, it is an exploration of women's agency as consumers. Ultimately, I contend that kakebo illuminate women's empowerment as consumers in the changing landscape of post-war Japan. I mentioned a few minutes ago that in 1968, Kimiko attended a household group course run by the Yokohama Seikyo Koa. At this course held once a month, the group decided to begin what they called a kakebo movement. And although Kimiko was new to the group, as a woman who had filled out her kakebo almost every day since her marriage back to 1954, oh, let me, I'll go back to a picture of her, um, she became central to this movement. Kimiko's responsibilities included collecting kakebo from female co-op members once a month. So Kimiko would have been responsible for about 800 members and calculated their expenses. Female members of the Seikyo co-op are still conducting this kind of research presently.
In 1950, uh, 1971, Kimiko became a Seikyo representative and began designing Kakebo to be published by Seikyo Co-op. Kimiko, uh, Kimiko's work included the design of expense tables and categories included in the Kakebo. Seikyo Co-op published, printed, and circulated 1,000 copies of Kimiko's Kakebo, and Kimiko herself began using it in 1972. At the time, Seikyo sold the Kakebo for 400 yen apiece. Seikyo is currently still printing the Kakebo design that Kimiko helped create, and has even applied the same scheme to their free Kakebo smartphone application. The purpose of Seikyo Co-op's Kakebo movement was to track the average prices of commodities, as well as other expenditures like taxes. The data compiled by Kimiko and her colleagues was printed in the newspaper and later presented to the Diet by the Ministry of Finance Committee in 1974. The national attention received by Seikyo Co-op resulted in the opening of Seikyo Co-ops across the country. Kimiko characterized the Kakebo's three main purposes in the following way to be helpful to women's lives, to be helpful to the work of Seikyo, and to help women speak out in their society. According to Kimiko, keeping a kakebo helped women participate more directly in their government and economy. As Kimiko suggested in one interview, however, kakebo also helped consumers think about maintaining a balanced diet. In this vein, Seikyo Co-op's grassroots activism on the part of housewives also addressed issues related to diet and food safety. In the 1970s, members of Seikyo Co-op became increasingly concerned about processed foods with harmful attitude, uh, additives. Wiener sausages and ham became frequent targets of housewives' criticisms. Yokohama's inadequate refrigeration infrastructure also became an issue that Seikyo took up, as a lack of refrigerated trucks and refrigerators in grocery markets resulted in large quantities of food rotting on grocery store shelves. From Kimiko's perspective, the Kakebo movement and concern over food commodities developed side by side. Seikyo's advocacy and the pivotal role that housewives played in setting and accomplishing the co-op's goals clearly articulated the connection between daily life and politics. By taking charge of the family budget and her husband's salary, and by carefully and consistently recording purchases in her Kakebo, Kimiko directly engaged with taxation and commodity price fluctuations on a regular basis. Kimiko also stated that keeping a kakebo enabled women to talk directly to their husbands about finances, and even more importantly, allowed them to influence their husbands' and families' awareness of the impact of politics on their lives. The type of activism that Kimiko was involved in, activism that highlights the relationship between politics and the kitchen, has a long history in Japan. Prior to the start of Japan's 15-year war, Okumumeo, a feminist and activist who fought for women's suffrage and political rights in the Taisho period, and who was voted into the national diet after the end of the war, believed achieving women's equality in the home would result in women achieving equality in the realm of politics. This political worldview motivated Oku to establish the Fujin Shi Kumiai Kyokai, or the Women's Consumer Cooperative Society, in 1928. Since women were typically in charge of household purchases, Oku's organization aimed to tap into women's collective power as consumers. The Women's Consumer, uh, Consumer Cooperative Society fought to lower prices for consumer goods that women often purchased, but the purpose behind this movement had a much deeper meaning for Oku, as she saw the broader significance of the organization as discovering new ways for all women to unite as an economic class and solve practical problems. From Oku's perspective, citizen consumer activism was one successful way to mobilize women to act politically, and Oku accomplished this goal prior to women's enfranchisement. Oku continued her women-led consumer-based political activism in the post-war when she founded the Housewives Federation, formed in 1948, um, to bring attention to the poor quality of matches that the government distributed to the public, the Housewives Federation worked to meet the basic needs of women and their families. Throughout the late 1940s and 1950s, the Federation opposed increases in food prices, including rice, tofu, and milk. They protested price hikes by throwing rallies, coordinating door-to-door -door canvassing, and boycotting food products with inflated prices. In 1954, the Federation began a 10 yen milk movement aimed at stabilizing the price of milk. When milk prices rose by one yen the following year, the housewives marched in opposition to the increase. The organization brought together hundreds of thousands of women who donned white aprons and, um, that represented typical housewife attire as their uniform. During protests, the housewives carried large signs in the shape of shimoji, or rice scoops. 
And in discussing her thoughts behind the usage of these rice scoops, Oku stated, a rice scoop can serve as a symbol of the cries, feelings, and minds of housewives all over the country. Desires, vexations, frustrations, and annoyances, every housewife might carry as many of, um, as many of these as the number of rice scoops in her kitchen. I'd like to address those desires and frustrations by laying them on the table of politics for consideration. The Housewives Federation advocated for the improved conditions of housewives' labor in the home and aimed to publicly politicize those conditions. The early post-war was the perfect time for Oku to relaunch a women's consumer movement. Under Japan's new constitution, promulgated by SCAP and the occupation forces, women finally achieved full political rights. Women all over the country quickly exercised their new rights. Um, on April 10, 1946, approximately 67% of women voted in Japan's first post-war national election. Additionally, 39 women were elected to the Diet. Oku began her term in office in 1947 and stayed for three terms until 1965. Japanese women finally experienced full political rights that many, like Oku, had fought so hard for in the early 20th century. In addition to achieving universal suffrage, women's activism helped to renounce martial motherhood, as well as the Meiji era good wife, wise mother, domestic ideology. Still, although the good wife, wise mother maxim was withdrawn, the prescriptive values that it had long promoted proved to be remarkably resilient and remained a powerful view of womanhood into the 1980s. Nonetheless, the name and attire of the Housewives Federation did not simply reflect a revised version of this antiquated gender ideal. I contend that housewifery in post-war Japan was no longer a domestic duty of women or domestic duty for women subjects. It had become a political power. Later um, labeled this, uh, wait, sorry, um, <laughs> that it was um, it had become a political power that was incisively and intentionally wielded by many women citizens like Oku and Kimiko. Furthermore, the poor food, shelter, and clothing conditions of the Japanese after the end of the war provided a good opportunity for women to come together and advocate for better living conditions. In doing so, they combined women's new political rights with early 20th century forms of citizen consumer activism, a form of activism that proved to be appealing to hundreds of thousands of women, um, just like those women who joined the Housewives Federation. The poor living conditions in the early post-war, however, do not sufficiently explain the rise of post-war housewives activism, which continued to expand and increase in the 1960s and 1970s, and continued in popularity at least into the 1990s. This activism became a long-standing form of housewives activism that continued despite Japan's improving and eventually thriving economy. In fact, it's safe to say that the housewife-dominated co-ops gained popularity in the 1960s and 1970s in part because of Japan's high-speed economic growth. According to scholar Kyoko Yamaguchi, Japan's econ uh, economy grew at the expense of the environment, food safety, and people's health, with significant negative side effects including inflation, pollution, and new cases of pollution diseases such as asthma, Minamata disease, and Itai-Itai disease. Furthermore, concerns about the increased use of food additives and preservatives that became popular with the industrialization of food systems during Japan's economic growth period occupied the minds of housewives like Kimiko. It was not always the case that politically active housewives followed the orders of the government. On the contrary, indeed, housewives led the way in criticizing the ineptitude of the government in handling the environmental consequences of high-speed economic growth. Both Oku and Kimiko saw a direct link between politics and the kitchen. In Oku's case, this thinking influenced her time in the diet, as she believed it was her duty to explicitly illustrate this connection to others, especially to her skeptical male colleagues. One year after Oku finished her third and final term as a member of the upper house of the diet in 1968, Kimiko joined Seikyo Co-op. Despite the improved economy from Kimiko's perspective, a lot of work remained to be done in demonstrating to politicians and the public alike the link between politics and housewives' daily lives. Housewives continued to carry on the work started by women like Okumumeo. Yet, when I met Kimiko over the summer and asked her about Okumumeo, she had never heard of her. Although the Housewives Federation rang a bell, it does not appear to be the case that Okumumeo and the Housewives, in Feder uh, Housewives Federation inspired all other organizations that drew the participation of housewives in large numbers. Based on Kimiko's answer, the development of consumer groups with similar interests appeared without necessarily directly influencing each other. The examples given in this paper have demonstrated that women like Kimiko and Oku um, embraced household management and budget keeping and clearly attached these roles to womanhood. 
While the pre-war good wife, wise mother was an apolitical symbol of womanhood, and the martial mother was a silent, voiceless, yet political symbol of womanhood, the post-war housewife was different in that she was a citizen who fully embraced verbal, public, political, and in many cases, pacifist activism. These citizen housewives did more than march in the streets, however. As household managers, they brought politics into the household. Kimiko even stated that keeping a kakebo allowed women the opportunity to talk to their husbands about how politics affected their lives. The post-war housewife was both a housewife and a citizen, and that was not a paradox for her. She brought politics with her everywhere she went, connecting consumption patterns and the stores they patronized to politics. She associated the kitchen with politics and saw herself as the manager of that reorganized and reimagined politicized space in the post-war. Thank you. Can we discuss prostitution or and specifically, you know, things like uh, really early occupation, you know, the uh, so-called recreation centers for allies? Uh, yeah, yes, right. Um, so talking about the feminists, did they talk did they discuss the RAA the centers, which were set up for the uh, Allied occupation officers in Japan? Yes, they did. And they were um, very uh, upset about some of the attitudes that were taken by the occupation forces toward Japanese women. Um, if initially, the RAA were set up in um, late August before the uh, arrival of the occupation forces in early September of 1945, and they lasted, the formal ones that were set up for the occupation heirs, um, until January, I think it was, of 1946, so not too long. Eventually, the occupation said, no, prostitution should be in the, uh, in the, pri the, other, the private sector rather than being run by the Japanese government. They said that it was antithetical to some of the goals of, of uh, equality for women to have government run uh, comfort women stations uh, for the occupation forces. Um, that, that said, um, the um, was organi Japanese women's organizations did come together again in the, in the months or weeks after the occupation, including the ones that were Christian organizations like the WCTU, the YWCA, and other organizations like that, who protested very strongly against the uh, occupations assuming that all Japanese women were potentially prostitutes. So, for example, they protested against women being taken off of public transportation to be cleansed and uh, taken away and, and inspected as potential prostitutes. And they said even middle class women, horrors, this is what upset them so much, like themselves were being um, uh, assumed to be potential prostitutes. That said, there was a huge amount of prostitution in Japan after the war. And uh, so while the occupation forces were there, uh, it was uh, uh, criticized by Japanese feminists, but it was done. And this, what I call in some works that I've done, the sexual nexus is very, very important between Japan and the United States primarily in the uh, time right after the war. Um, after the occupation ended, there was a very active movement in Japan to stop licensed prostitution uh, and to, to criminalize it in Japan, which it eventually did in 1956 or 57, I think. And not because the, the winning argument was not that prostitution was harmful to the women who were in brothels, but rather it was harmful to the children of Japan to see prostituted women because they were immoral. And that was the argument that won the day in the diet. So Japanese women's organizations were part of that anti-prostitution. Well, you're that, you know, feminists sort of suffer from uh, almost well, I'm sorry? What would you say your feminists suffer from almost immediate, you know, amnesia about the empire? Uh, no, I wouldn't say they suffered from amnesia about the empire because they didn't have, they never had a consciousness of it uh, so much. They had a consciousness of the empire being a bad thing because the war came home to them and that war was terrible and that, you know, uh, even in the empire war was a terrible thing. But I think that the most of the feminists that I um, cover in here, in this paper, uh, did not until much later come to a realization that the, uh, the empire had bred a certain kind of gendered injustice um, and uh, 
they had basically were, I think they were blind to it uh, for uh, a long time. And then they weren't. And then they said, oh, basically, we get it. But many of them were dead by then. So I think that, I, I, I really do think that there was uh, not so much amnesia, but a lack of cognizance even at the time. Okay. Um, just, just one more question, you know, and um, if I could get your opinion of everybody, that would be great. Um, when you think about, you know, the authorities, right, they're always sort of like uh, telling women, you should wear makeup, you should, you know, look like a lady, right? Would you say that during the war, um, like some of the regulations against wearing makeup and, you know, uh, wearing dresses or something like that, would you say that feminine, outward femininity or visible femininity is almost treated like a luxury? And that there is a diminishment of, you know, I guess outward physical, you know, femininity during the war. Do you think the, you know, sort of like anti-luxury regulations, no wearing lipstick, no wearing cosmetics, you know, no wearing dress, um, what do you think? I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. Luxury, luxury was the, extravagance was the enemy, so outward femininity. Yeah, they were supposed to, they were supposed to wear what they called standard clothing. And standard clothing was, I mean, was absolutely established for men. You could see that in the, what the men, what, the, what was his name? The, the, the actor himself was wearing the regulated standard clothing. and and his wife was wearing uh, something that was pretty close to Japanese women's standard clothing, but they, they didn't press it so much for women as they did for men, except extravagance was the enemy. So they, you should not have any pretty clothes. I mean, that was having pretty clothes pretty awful, right? Yes, but I think class comes into it again, just yeah, it class comes so in much again. in what you were saying. Um, because there are lots of magazine pictures and um, you know other circulated visual discourse things with middle class women and upper class women dressed in really very pretty dresses, so long as they're wearing the tusky mm -hmm. that says what their role is, you know, as the fire warden for their neighborhood or something, or the kapogi, the, you know, the apron that women were supposed to wear in the kitchen, but now they wore it out of the house as a kind of uniform, as, um, is it Kanomikio, or somebody writes about this. Mm -hmm. um, at, oh, uh, the at home front clothing. That's right. Kind of uh, oh, about okay. the, the kapogi becoming uniform, that suddenly uniform women the, right. the, coming out of the kitchen could continue to look feminine as long as they were, um, you know, marked as women by this by this thing, and as long as they were sort of upper class. Yeah. If you were lower class, then you're supposed to wear the hyojunfuku mm -hmm. for sure, and not wear any makeup and not do anything to your hair, um, or you're supposed to be out in the countryside as a woman wearing monpe, okay. or you know, monpe in the tonarigumi neighborhood associations where you're helping to fill up the fire buckets and this kind of thing. So I think it was classed as well as just. A, a matter of um, all luxury is bad. Some luxury is still okay for certain women, um, as long as they have this, this war sign on them, the tusky or the kapogi, on top of the luxury. Uh, Mopey wouldn't be considered pants or trousers. Hmm. What, I'm sorry about Mopey wouldn't, wouldn't be considered pants. Well, they were like farmer clothes, weren't they? Yeah, say? I mean, they're, farmer they're clothes. sort of trousers. They're sort of trousers, right. They're sort of trousers that you wear pulled up over your kimono and all your kimono yeah. is stuffed down in to there. To keep your kimono really clean. Yeah, yeah, it seems really uncomfortable, but yeah. In Canada, you know, I'm old enough to remember the 1960s and little girls couldn't wear trousers in school. You know, like it was really... Except on snow days, that was in the U.S. too. On snow days, you could wear them. Well, exactly. You called them leggings. Except we had to put them on, under our skirts. <laughs> under but the skirts. Don't right. you think wartime, even in Canada, was an exception to that, where women were allowed to wear trousers mm -hmm. as long as they were doing it for war work? Yeah. yeah, Rosie the Riveter wore trousers, yeah. trousers right. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, hi, uh, I'm a grad student at the Asian Studies, uh, uh, and I have a question for the Hilly Merkson. Mer 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 uh, hi. <laughs> uh, so, like, I, I, I want to know how you approach the like how you read their uh, account book? Like how, how do you, uh, do you like analyze the account book itself? Or like, and I have another question, I have two questions. That, that is one, my first question. And second one is like, so like you, you were looking at the social movement of their, uh, 
uh, the Seikyo Kake movement. Yes. And, yes, yes. And it, I, it was really interesting to me because, like, like, because uh, there are lots of discussion against Seikyo Shifu. So, like, like I mean, like, like such as like a, like a Marx feminist or essentialist things about like our surrounding about Shifu itself. Like, how does it like participate in the like? Does it, is there any like interaction be, between these this like uh, discourse with uh, in that movement? Like, is there any like or participants themselves? Uh, like, like how long has it? Like, because uh, as as you know that Western feminists started from like kind of like a. Uh, like a being, being housewives yeah. kind of, was a kind of problematic to themselves, right? right. So the grassroots movement started. <laughs> but like, like to those uh, single up shifu in the movement, like how how do they? I don't know, but like I I want I want I want you to elaborate the movement. So. Um, so first, I'll answer your first question about how I read uh, account books. So a big part of the project is um, a food history, and it's looking at the central role that women played in transforming the Japanese diet in the post-war. And so what I did is I went through every single account book from 1954 to 1964, and I wrote down every single food item she purchased, and then I counted how many times every single year she purchased those items. And I will show you a list I made during the primary source workshop that we do, because that was a lot of work to go through and do that. So that's how I read the account book. But as you can see, there's still so much more information in there. So I was really just looking at food history, but there's still so much more work to be done on these uh, kakebo as uh, primary sources. As for the Kakebo movement, you're absolutely right that when I was working, uh, as I work with, with housewives in my, my research, I have to ask myself about all of the critiques of housewives by Western feminists or even Japanese feminists about um, housewife being a, a negative uh, view of womanhood. And I, I think my research challenges that to a certain extent while also pointing out that some women don't like this view of womanhood, and that's part of what we're seeing too in post-war Japanese feminisms. So I personally see the housewife as being political. She's not an apolitical figure, so she's very much involved with politics, at least the kind of housewives we see involved in the Kakebo movement. Um, I would say that there's a political sense. They're not just apolitical women. Thank you. Just uh, um, two comments about clothing, just these are semi-anecdotal, but one, there are artifacts in the Hiroshima Museum of beautiful summer dresses with black rain stains on them. So women were wearing pretty summer dresses when the bomb was dropped, not all of them, of course. And this is an anecdotal thing from um, dance people I knew that were dancing um, during the war, is that they practiced classical Japanese dance in, in uh, haori and western clothes so they could run faster if something happened. So they talked about having to not be in kimono because you can't escape and hide. So that they were actually doing their practice in just the haori. So that they could use the sleeves because it's required in Japanese dance so they wouldn't wear a full kimono. So that may be some reason for some of the, the outfits. And this is a question about the children's books. We saw very few girls. Were there, um, if you know, role models portraying what the women should be, they weren't mothers, but for the girls, like girls dressed in practical clothing, or girls not playing dress up, or, or you know, some sort of role model for the girls. In terms of dress, you mean? Well, not just dress, dress, but in general. general, there's so many examples of boys being exemplary soldiers and little sound guy and you know, the masters of the house. Were, were there the same kind of imagery for women? Or? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I've, I've, of course, uh, I had to make a selection for the purposes of the paper, but mm -hmm. um, there are lots of images, lots of images in children's books uh, with girls in them. Um, the um, in in the afternoon workshop, I'll show you a sugoroku uh, that I had up in in the talk as well, and that is exclusively, it's produced for as a supplement to a girls' magazine. And it uh, shows produ uh, exclusively images. So you move with a dice, right? You throw a dice and then move forward. 
uh, all of the images are images about how girls are supposed to behave at wartime. Uh, so all the themes that we've touched upon come up again, frugality, how you shouldn't desire a beautiful kimono, you should take the old kimono and take it apart and put the good parts back together so that you don't have to buy anything new. Um, you should um, uh, get up early in the morning, don't sleep in. Uh, you should eat whatever your mom puts on the table, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of instructions for girls um, in, in terms of that. I found it rather uh, interesting in many of the images that uh, feature boys and girls. Um, very often girls are in Western clothes. Um, boys are often in school uniforms or some other version of some uniform. Um, yeah. And and so and, and of course girls are also sometimes in kimono, um, but uh, yes, there are lots of instructions for for girls. And actually, in the Tsugoroku, just in case you can't stay and um, look at that in great detail, um, the Tsugoroku um, also is very suggestive in terms of the centrality of war making as boys slash men's work because. The girls move on the outside of the paper game uh, through the various conventions and norms for girls. And then at the center, there's a map. And there are features of you know, landscape features with soldiers defending the local population and so on and so forth. And that's where the girls disappear. There are no more girls as you move at, to the center um, and, and to the actual uh, war making activities, but the field goal, I mean the goal field, sorry, the goal field is the kind of image I showed uh, as depicted on book covers and in other contexts, namely a soldier holding the winning girl or boy and some other children I around on his arm. And so then you have sort of the same kind of soldier and children coming together in a happy uh, union again. I noticed uh, one line in the cable about the husband's jaw. <laughs> and it had, the first item I saw that, in fact, I think the only item I saw was his allowance. Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit more on perhaps the negotiation process and the power relationships that might go into that number? Right. So the the ideal power relationship in terms of finance in post-war Japan, and you can see this in women's magazines in the post-war, is that the husband is supposed to give all of his salary to his wife, and she's supposed to pay all the bills and then give him an allowance back. And he can spend that allowance on going out to drink or whatever. And this was a, a pretty common gender ideal. It, um, I have some images with me today to show as well that show um, images depicting women giving an allowance to their husband. And a lot of the articles talk about this as like it's perfectly normal and natural and this is the way it should be. How would that number be negotiated? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that would probably depend per couple, I imagine. I can't, I can't say that the, the husband had absolutely no say whatsoever. I imagine there was some sort of discussion, but the idea was that the housewife was in charge uh, of the purse strings. It is sometimes a little stipend. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for various aspects of uh, women and children. And I don't know, there are so many questions. But for the first speaker, uh, Dr. Mom, you mentioned about a uh, kind of concept shift on um, other words. Mm -hmm. And I just, uh, it's beyond your talk. I just, uh, you concentrate on uh, 30s and 20s and early on. But uh, post war, definitely, the last speaker um, mentioned definitely there is a shift on the mother word because they are in the financial minister of finance. But can you, probably everybody could. Uh, but the shift in motherhood and uh, pre-war and the war and the post-war and if possible, I don't think I'm asking too much, but the present, what's happening now? 
Yeah. That's a very, very large Big question. question. Yes. <laughs> we address that. We address that in the podcast this morning uh, about the shifts in um, conceptions of motherhood and the role of the mother in the family. Um, and there's many, many parts to it, but I'll just throw in a few that are of interest to me. One of the things that I thought was important was during the motherhood protection debate in 1918, approximately then, uh, among a number of feminists who um, argued what was the role of the mother, should mothers be protected, is motherhood the body of the woman or is it the kind of role of the woman? Um, and we'll see people like Hiratsuka Daicho, for example, being pre preeminent in saying that uh, mothers serve an important role and therefore they deserve the vote. This was before women had the vote. So she connected it, motherhood to uh, political rights. Um, and afterwards, after that point, motherhood gets talked about a great deal more, at least from the way I have seen it, um, in Japan. Now, up to, the reason I talked about a shift happening around 1943 um, was that uh, up until then, there was a, an enormous amount of discourse about the importance of the mother in, in being the head of the family, taking care of all the children. Mothers must be selfless, but selfless in the name of the family. Um, after about 1943, you get much more discussion about the fact that being selfless in the name of the family was actually selfish um, because it didn't serve the nation. And so the nation in kind of death throes of the war becomes more important. I also s believe, and I, this was beyond the scope of, of my talk, after the war you, go, you flip back to mother in service to the family rather than motherhood in service to the nation. So it seems to me that the service to the nation um, is always there uh, from about the teens on because mothers give birth to children who then serve the nation in different ways, like Republican motherhood in the United States after the Revolutionary War. So it's very similar to that kind of idea. But then it becomes specifically nation-centered during the Pacific War. And after that, you go back to a different notion of motherhood. Now, I'm not going to address the contemporary because there are other people who have much more um, developed ideas on this panel than I do about that. I think that's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, not so much on the, uh, the contemporary, but I would say in, in the post where to add on to what Dr. Maloney, uh, Maloney was saying, um, that you also see a change in voice, I think, in how mothers are talking about motherhood in general. So let, if we continue the story of Hiratsuka Daicho, in the post-war, she starts the Haha Oya Taikai, mm. so the Mother's Congress, and the idea was that women were now making demands of the state on what they felt that they needed as mothers. So you see more of mothers standing up and saying, as a mother, we need this from you as a society, we need this kind of support. So I think that you could see a shift in, um, in demand, and also uh, motherhood begins to be tied to pacifism in the post-war as well, that we as mothers need to uh, protect our children from war, and that was especially after um, became, uh, the Bikini Atoll, Bikini. Um, when uh, some fishermen were basically affected and food was affected um, during uh, some test, bombing nuclear tests, tests, nuclear tests, yes. Um, so you, you have this link to um, motherhood and pacifism. Mm -hmm in the, the post-war period. More contemporary, I don't know. Any questions amongst the panel? May I just say one word about the contemporary um, situation? I think it, it's an interesting moment because, of course, the kind of cachet motherhood has had in these various different incarnations is almost gone in contemporary Japan at a time when the state and regional governments and every municipality really scrambles to get women to have a child. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. right. And so, but at the same time, um, there are these pub, there's another discourse this is about, that is about very strongly about getting more women into the workforce and uh, allowing to have women real careers. So there's no real um, valoration of motherhood as, as, an, as a singular kind of achievement, uh, which I think is very interesting. Uh, also when you, you know, in, in contemporary urban Japan at least, when you see these very young families with one child and, and how they, 
scramble to control the one child, the golden thing they have produced. <laughs> it's a very, it's a very different, a very different uh, project than it was even 20 years ago, I think. I guess I, I do have one question, and I feel we're expanding. I mean, you're talk, talking about the, the way that uh, women continue to be political in the post-war period by continuing the same kind of petition drive, other types of ballot drives. Uh, same, you can say it's a continuity of what we see in the Meiji period. And of course, there's been great work uh, that's been done on this regard. Uh, but what's significant about that is that was a time when women didn't have the vote. But after 1946, they do have the vote. Is there do they bring in more kind of ballot box initiatives into these same types of like the haha ha uh, you mentioned, uh, or the other types of uh, march movements? Yeah. There, does it also translate into ballot box movements? Um, so Okumumeo was definitely a, a big supporter of voting, that women had to vote in order to uh, f be fully political. In terms of voting drives, though, I just haven't found a lot of information on that in the post-war, and I actually wonder if anyone else has, maybe. Uh, you mean it, voting for feminist, right. uh, fe specifically feminist yeah. candidates and so forth. Um, the only person I can think of at all uh, was Khan Nauto, mm -hmm. um, who was prime minister. Um, Ten years ago, or eight years ago, something like that, um, who was the, um, the, the highest ranking, I forget what title he had, but um, uh, highest ranking assistant to Ichika Fusai when she was in the, uh, was in the diet uh, before her death. And so he cut his political teeth on uh, feminist thinking um, and then went on to work in the Ministry of Health. Um, and so forth, and then eventually becomes prime minister. Um, but he ran at a time when the Liberal Democratic Party was on the outs and, and uh, was able to put forward a number of, of ideas that feminist groups had been interested in, primarily peace ideas, apologizing to Asia for Japanese war crimes and, and things like that. Um, so that is, uh, one way in which I can see post-war feminist agendas getting into the political system. Now, when you look at Abe, who talks about women shining and so forth and trying to uh, do his womanomics uh, program, I don't think a lot of feminists would say that this uh, is responsive to their concerns. Um, and yet the language is language of empowering or getting women into the workplace without, of course, well, there was language also about childcare in there. Um, it hasn't been very successful, um, but uh, it, that kind of language act, it has become part of the discourse to a certain extent. But that's all I can say. I, can't, I, I cannot think of lots of successes. The current mayor of Tokyo is a woman. Um, she's finally been, she's been forced to call herself a feminist. She didn't want to at first. Um, and she says there should be more women in government. But I would not say that her agenda is one that um, is representative of most feminists in Japan. So um, it's you know two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, only paradoxes to offer. I mean, that's all I can say. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll add just another point there is that I think after Okumumeo had spent three terms in the diet, she was very frustrated with her, her colleagues yeah. there. And so I would just like to reinforce the idea that politics is more than voting. It really yeah. is in terms of being active and being involved um, in petitioning, and canvassing, and marching. These things are just as important in many ways. Um, and I think we see that in the United States today as yeah. well. Right. Can I ask a question very quickly following up on this? Um, you mentioned that in the first election, 67% of the women who were eligible voted, and 39 women were elected to the Diet. As I understand it, that's the high point that has never again been reached. That is correct. Right? Yes. <laughs> so that suggests that the ballot box has not been a place where women have directed their efforts. 
So, planning from um, uh, Edo eras to Meiji, and coming all the way from to show us um, there was a prostitution in Japan, and many of the girls were sold by their parents against their will. And um, and even now, it is um, prostitution is illegal, but there was no punishment, and everybody knows that there are many some places so uh, the women are offering sex services. And um, I kind of find kind of weird to me that I, did, I, I made, once we made a research on the prostitution business and constitution, and uh, I didn't find uh, some of the feminists are strongly opposed and argue for the eradication of the uh, prostitution in Japan, but I don't see any significant opposition or some very strong condemnation from the feminists in Japan. So I just wanted to know that what is your take and what is your impression? Is there any, something special about the feminism in Japan with respect to this kind of issues, or is this kind of much more worldwide um, tendencies? I would say it's worldwide. In fact, this is one of the great debates that happened uh, has happened over time in um, North America as well. Uh, the idea is it's sex trades of women making choices on their own to go into sex trades, or is, pros is it prostitution of people being in, put in an inferior position against their will? And even people who talk about um, sex work as being something that is not necessarily forced upon women by an individual, is it forced upon women by societal conditions um, that force them to do this. Uh, today we talk mainly, and I think um, it's in Japan as well as in, in Western countries, talk mainly about sex trafficking. So in other words, people coming over borders uh, to be involved in the sex trades. And uh, it's always been a big question. The EU has been struggling with this question too because they have so many people coming into the EU from outside uh, with refugees uh, today and um, over time as well, and people being brought from Southeast Asia and other places, um, that uh, the question is, are pe do people come seeking uh, employment opportunities, or do people come because they are kidnapped and um, trafficked? So um, this is an ongoing question, and I think that it's a, a question uh, not only in Japan, but in every other country that, that sees uh, the existence of, of prostitution, both uh, domestic uh, workers, sometimes often underage, um, or people who come from other countries, so uh, in terms of sex trafficking. So uh, I don't think there's a unified point of view. There's, there's a, lot of, a, lot of dis a lot of difference among feminists over what to do about, if anything, about prostitution. Maybe if I can add something to that, there's an Asian women network yeah. against sex trafficking, so there is uh, a lot of activism. I'm unsure how effective it is, but uh, there's, there's certainly movement in that direction. Uh, one aspect about uh, Japan, although I don't know exactly international variations on that, is that the 1956 uh, law that prohibits prostitution and then a newer law from 1999 that prohibits child mm. prostitution and pornography, uh, both laws define what constitutes prostitution and what constitutes sex work very narrowly as heteronormative, penetrative uh, kind of sex. So I think that's also part of the basis for the relative inattention uh, 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 to uh, prostitution, I believe. But um, looked at it from a global perspective, I think, uh, you know, just in addition to what Barbara uh, said here, uh, with which I totally agree, the biggest sex trader is the American military mm -hmm. from a global perspective. Okay, so I think no matter whether we talk about sex trade in Asia or sex trade in Europe or in other parts, uh, it's the military that is uh, primarily responsible for uh, sex trade. And so I wouldn't be surprised whether there are all kinds of mechanisms in place to pre precisely not direct our attention uh, to prostitution. 
Thank you very much for a um, wonderful um, discussion. And um, that um, the discussion reminds me of the, um, the issues of uh, conflict women. Um, and uh, what I have noticed um, is the rising kind of right-wing uh, women <laughs> in Japan, you know, who um, really um, uh, the uh, condemns actually um, you know, the you know, Korean government, um, you know, um, because um, they believe that conflict women were hostages, and, you know, all these you know arguments, right? And um, when we look at uh, the con contemporary Japan, um, maybe we can call it a fundamentalist movement of women um, who really supports the. Uh, the right wing causes, right? So I'm just wondering about um, the historical um, trajectory of that kind of, uh, you know, women uh, in, you know, 150 years. Um, if there are <laughs> um, any, um, if there's any research on the kind of, um, you know, right wing women's not movement, but you know right-wing uh, women who supported the cause of the, um, the conservative uh, you know, politics and so forth? Uh, there have been right-wing uh, organizations in Japan from the early part of the 20th century. Um, so things like um, Aikoku Fujinkai, um, and, which was made up primarily of upper-class women. Um, and so, there, and then there were others that were uh, formed um, at other times. Um, I don't know if they really addressed um, comfort women um, at all. They, they didn't think about it. Um, uh, they didn't think about them because they were just prostitutes. Um, if they even thought about what was going on um, on the battlefront. I should point out, this I had a much longer paper, I had to cut it, which is why I read, I tried to read as fast as I could to get, make an argument. Um, but I should also point out that um, today, of course, the largest um, uh, institution that supports prostitution is the American military globally. Um, but it's also true that during World War II, Japan was not alone in having um, uh, people who were uh, involved in sexually serving the military uh, on the battlefront. That never excuses it. Never, never. And I don't want to say just because Americans and Australians and, and British and others in China and Chinese had uh, um, uh, people who were, were serving the military. That does not excuse the military prostitution that was carried out uh, by the Japanese military. Um, but it was a phenomenon that uh, you didn't have to be particularly right-wing to um, think was acceptable because after all these women were prostitutes and men needed to have uh, comfort, uh, whether it is uh, comfort during the day in terms of nurses and people cleaning their clothes and, and what uh, Yamaka Kikwe would have called slave labor of cleaning clothes and making food. She didn't call sex the slave labor though, and sex at night. Um, so these kinds of things were unexceptional to many people um, during that time period. And they have become, rightly so, exceptional to us and something that we should speak about. But uh, uh, it's, it is not something that uh, was really talked about by left, right, or center, I think, until after the war, I believe. Mm -hmm. Well, we should uh, give our panelists a break. Uh, and maybe we'll take a few minutes before we start the primary workshop. So please uh, join me once again in thanking each of our panelists. Thank you. Okay.